notes because otherwise it could take three hours. Um, firstly, thank you all for being here. Special thanks to Karen for organizing this conference here in beautiful Southern California. <laughs> Especially happy given that the Northeast is just beginning to see the, uh, the nasty seasonal underbelly where I came from, so great to be here. I also want to say it's an honor to be addressing so many political leaders from so many great nation states, people I respect, uh, people like Dan Hannon, uh, who are leading the charge on conserving sovereignty around the world. Many from the place where established sovereignty is most under attack, the old continent, where so sovereignty was philosophically birthed and put into action, Europe. It'd be a pleasure for me to talk for a few minutes today about the historical roots of popular sovereignty, as well as how we got to where we currently are, with the developed world political trend of rising nationalist, anti-establishment, populist, conservative, sovereignty-centric, right-wing parties gaining ground, especially in Europe, as mentioned, the philosophical birthplace of the very idea. I focus on sovereignty as the overriding thematic issue on which to focus, although I know the title in the program today is Freedom, Sovereignty, and Individual Rights, because it is only through sovereignty that the other two of these ideals, freedom and individual rights, are possible. Without recognized and respected, fully upheld sovereignty, the entire premise of post-enlightenment Western political practice, modern representative democracy, is absolutely nullified. This Western political tradition, which I see as being uh, begun in 1648 and continued from there, which exalted nation-state sovereignty as a tenet of legitimate government, produced three plus centuries of an unrivaled expansion in every social good. First in the West and then ultimately exported to the world at large. Science, technology, market development, hygiene, diet, health, wellness and longe longevity, poverty levels, education access, in short, all standards to which quality of life for a human being can be measured, measure better today and in every half century or so sequential increment than its antecedent one. I know it's not a perfectly straight line graphically, but this trend has been overwhelmingly powerful. In 1648, the Treaty of Westphalia was signed, reordering the political operations of Europe away from a practice of war as first resort toward one of attempted diplomacy. The treaty was signed by 109 parties over five months. The territorial agreements by the nation states and imperial states of the Holy Roman Empire took five years to hammer out. For this Westphalian order to work, there had to be a recognition and acknowledgement of the agreed upon positions each nation state maintained. The lasting legacy of this accord that settled many of Europe's existing issues of the time was the inviolability of borders and non-interference in the domestic affairs of these now recognized sovereign states. This was the very basis of the modern international order to this day. From this period on, Europe had set the stage for flourishing. The classical liberals of the Enlightenment, Hobbes, Locke, Locke Rousseau, saw liberty delivering it and securing it as the primary political ideal to be pursued by the governed the social contract, legitimacy, individual rights, and ultimately representative democracy all had its roots in the stabilizing of the European continental theater that the Westphalian order delivered. Of course there were still wars, territorial disputes, piracy, imperialism, and the all sorts of other chicanery that those with political power will get into with other holders of political power. As Lord Acton alluded regarding the corruptive character of power, those who maintain political power will most often have, will most often be replete with ambitions, moral failings, and sinister, self-interested, and or messianic motives. But that there was a new way to adjudicate disputes through diplomatic engagement, bilaterally or multilaterally, changed the evolution of Western international relations. The historically important Congress of Vienna in 1815 was such an example of this in practice an organized, civilized, methodical airing of sovereign grievances that restored a stable balance of power to the European continent as it was being roiled. World Wars I and II, with the developed world's industrial level technological capabilities, delivered death on a mechanized scale theretofore never seen. The power wielded and weaponized by one sovereign state actor, Germany, was motivated by imperial nationalist ambitions. The deeply battered Europe that survived, albeit with new fault lines such as the post-Yalta Eastern Central European order, had many leaders who desired to remake the continental political dynamic for a quote unquote modern age. In this post-war period where the philosophers were philosophizing over what went wrong, they seized upon the nationalist component of German Nazi philosophy. 
This component of the Nazi ideology was viewed as the catalyst for the attempt at world domination. They ignored the socialist part of the Nazi platform as they were prone to subscribe to this economic philosophy themselves. It is not coincidental that the thought leadership was weighted toward the French philosophical schools of political and social thinkers, firmly ensconced on the left in the academy and the state's political complex. They were quick to condemn and blame the nationalism, but not the socialism. These were not great appreciators of Edmund Burke's reflection on their revolution. His condemnation of the revolutionary's attack on French traditional institutions and the fervent predisposition towards statism did not mesh with their modern philosophical worldview. Theirs was a worldview much closer to the one propagated by the revolutionaries and encapsulated by Robespierre's and the Jacobins, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, which Burke correctly predicted would later be reduced to the absurd during the status tyranny of the reign of terror. The idea that it was now time for United States of Europe to, co to combat the extreme nationalism that had just roiled the continent gained a media currency in the late 40s and early 50s. Initially, this was to be built around values, human rights and democracy, rather than on economics and trade. Sovereign governments could choose to work together on their own volition with no supranational authority. But by 1952, the harmonization of political decision-making was not aligning quickly enough for many of the more socialist and more integrationist in the pro-Federation camp. So the fathers of the European Union, including Monet, Schumann, de Gasperi, and Spock, initiated the European Coal and Steel Community with six original signatories. The ECSC was the first international organization to be based on the principles of supranationalism. It was an actual governing body built expressly to devolve power from the sovereign state, initially on a voluntary basis, toward the supranational authority. And it was meant to regulate coal and steel, the two necessary inputs to wage industrial level war. These also happened to be the two key industrial economic sectors of the time, not coincidental. And so the European Union was born the first true supranational governing authority in human history. This was sovereignty fully seated, impartially seated, not catalyzed by being on the receiving end of a tank or a gun, but ushered in democratically where free peoples with the goal of warless utopia voted to devolve their statehoods to a federation. Of course, many a coercive sales pitch was made by the growing bureaucracy in order to obtain popular support. And of course, Schengen and the free movement of people, goods, capital, and services would unlock value. The economics of a monetary union and a common currency would reduce transaction costs and tie peoples more closely together. After all, those who make trade together war less. This multi-generational age of integration, harmonization on policy, and what the contemporary political descendants of the EU forefathers now fashionably call cohesion stayed on trend, deepening as the decades marched on and did not abate for 60 years. In this more than a half century, though, some curious byproducts of post-sovereign utopia manifested. The economics of the common currency could only work when there was continual growth in the real economy or nominal growth by adding more consumers and adopters of the currency, like a Ponzi scheme. Bernard Connolly, Baroness Thatcher's chosen economist to analyze the exchange rate mechanism, how it would look giving up your sovereign currency for the common one, sounded the alarm that this could eventually lead to ruin once growth hits a wall. He was suspended and, suspended and slandered in Brussels ad nauseum for his sound economics, but he did successfully keep the UK from trading in their pounds for euros. His book, The Rotten Heart of Europe, is a must read for those interested in the economics that underpins the common currency's natural pitfalls. As Connolly pointed out, and as we later saw, shocks and recessions and even destabilizing political episodes could, would, and did prove disastrous because there would be no remedy for European policymakers to seize upon that could be executed as guaranteed by the EU constitution that wouldn't be at odds with the national constitutions of member states. Fiscal policy and budgetary constructions were domestic issues definitionally. The taxation and spending within a nation state is an absolute underpinning of sovereignty. And the monetary policy of the European Central Bank would impact different nations differently so the determining motives on actions tended toward those that were beneficial for the biggest states, especially that one country with the biggest economy in Europe by far, Germany an economy that had been successfully rebuilt in the post-war era by factors such as the American-funded Marshall Plan, the prohibition of the German state from rebuilding its military, and a culture whose industriousness has been heralded for centuries. Yes, culture does in fact matter. It always has and always will. This particular byproduct of integration, the monetary policy as a backdoor to fiscal policy control, led directly to the reduced national sovereignty of a member nation. This occurred within the Greek debt crisis of 2009 
which lasted a lot longer than 2009. It could be argued that it still persists today, a decade later. Without going too deep into the economics of the situation, Greece was well over their skis with a highly levered sovereign balance sheet, financed by cheap money as priced by the ECB, lent by highly levered German banks looking for profits with little regard for the systemic risk they were exacerbating with loose lending standards. Probably learned from their American high finance cousins and other per pernicious symptoms of the globalism that we often talk about, I'm sure we'll get into much in this conference. After the American recession of 2008 went global, the malinvestment into the debtor states of the Club Med southern economies of Europe by the lender states of the industrial northern Europe with their large banking and investment systems came to the forefront of global finance. There was a potential for major banking collapse, which like the Wall Street subprime mess in America may have led to a global banking contagion and crippling global depression, or not. But the political and financial establishment of Europe in Brussels and Germany and France, et cetera, were not about to find out organically because if there could have been a reorganization of European financial institutions amidst the Southern European debt write-downs, many large politically connected banks, mostly German, would have failed. Deutsche Bank is still at risk today. And I do believe it is functionally insolvent, kept alive only by ECB policies that allow it to remain functionally comatose. As a result of these political gyrations, Greece fully lost its sovereignty and became a debt vassal to the private component of the banking system of the supranational governance authority. Prime Minister Papandreou was replaced by a former vice president of the ECB in a snap electoral process where the pro-EU political and media voices weighed in vocally about a falling sky should the Greeks not validate the steward Brussels had selected for them. This steward, Papademos, orchestrated an EU-constructed bailout, though truth be told, it wasn't a bailout per se, given the crippling austerity the Greeks had foisted upon them by the European Supranational Authority, nicknamed the Troika, made up of the European Commission, the Politburo of the EU, so to speak, the ECB, and the IMF. Unemployment predictably spiked, Greece lost a generation, and is still in a malaise that is yet to recover from with no real end in sight. This is just one example, and up to that point, it was the grandest in scale, of a single nation state's sovereignty so diminished by EU pressures or diktats. Greece might have come out of this economic crisis with different outcomes had they been allowed to return to their pre-EU pre currency, the drachma, or even exit the EU in full. But these options never had an honest chance to be put to the Greek people as a departure from the Federation may have had ripple effects that the establishment was not going to experiment with. This was anathema to them and put their whole agenda of deep inter integration at the risk of unraveling. They wanted more integration, not disintegration. It is clear that in this case, the diminished sovereignty led to a reduction in freedom for the Greek people. There are many examples in the post-2008 world, uh, the moment when the global economy teetered on a brink of what potentially would have been a deleteriously chaotic time for the political establishment. The EU leadership and the nations and those political classes heavily invest in the economics of the EU and the philosophy of EU could not let this happen. What happened with Greece happened similarly in Italy a year later when an EU-aligned technocrat, Mario Monti, received a threadbare mandate, became prime minister and installed a fully unelected technocrat government to implement austerity. Legitimacy in the EU in the enlightened classical liberal Hobbesian and Lockean sense was not so much of a concern to the integrationists. Only the appearance thereof in so much as they could maintain a rhetorical fig leaf. There were referendums, such as Lisbon, where the votes for deeper alignment and our integration were rejected. So the results of rejection were duly rejected. And the referendums held again at times guaranteed to produce lower turnout and positive outcomes of, quote unquote, more Europe. Recently in Italy again, the EU has put their hand on the scales to encourage a restructuring of government as a vociferously hostile populist nationalist conservative political party leader, the most popular politician in the country, has been scuttled. I, of course, have been talking of Matteo Salvini, who is a thorn in the side of the Eurocentric Brussels establishment over issues like borders, unfettered migration, and the sovereign decision-making capacity of his country. He, like seemingly 70% or so of his countrymen, want more of it, their sovereignty back. Imperial Brussels, like Rome 2,000 years ago, would prefer to hold on to the sovereignty of these societies that comprise its far-flung membership. And of course, we have Brexit, the first moment that may prove to be the inflection. After 60 years of integration, here was the first reversal therein. The UK, of course, having been one of the great and earliest proponents of codified rule of law, it was fitting that this island, geographically apart from the continent, led this charge, demanding the return of this sovereignty. The Brexit movement had germinated for years, and by 2016, the, Brit the Brits decided they'd had enough, and they called a referendum. This was the greatest thing David Cameron ever did in his whole life, and he is deeply, depressively regretful over it. Go figure. 
There are some great memes online that just are incredibly enjoyable. Uh, there were so many issues the Brits had felt they were getting the short end of the stick on, whether it was balance of payments and basic economic cost versus benefit, the fishing rights to their ancestral waters, regulations on the electrical output of their tea kettles and toasters, and even discussions of outright bans, migration quotas and mandates, a litany of protectionist policies that the Continentals were foisting upon their island neighbors, etc. The Brits wanted out, or at a minimum they wanted to see if their countrymen also wanted out. They voted, and despite the scare tactics of those aligned with the Eurocentrist worldview, the people spoke in favor of exiting the Federation. I, for one, listened to the soundtrack of Les Mis on a loop all through that entire night, uh, fully, uh, fully cognizant of the irony of the soundtrack being an idealization of the French Revolution. This was not lost on me. Negotiating the exit exposed the real face of this technocratic leviathan laid bare for all Brits, Europeans, and the world to see. The Eurocrats' slow walking of attempted points of agreement for exit, the ignoring entreaties from democratically elected representatives, even still with a party called the Brexit Party receiving the biggest mandate from the British electors this past May for the EP, the putative separation fines, the threat of spiteful treatment with regard to trade with British industry, Guy Verhofstadt joking about guillotines. Now this guy is a prime candidate, Guy, to read Burke. Commissioners on video drinking wine joking about the Brits uh, having, being made to suffer for leaving, etc. If you believe in the state and governmental bodies with a fervor that is bordering on religious, the EU can do no wrong. Establishment leftist and technocratic states are the answer to what ails society, even after sovereignty is visibly shredded and frayed and broken. But I believe there's a silent majority in every educated and developed society that instinctively knows when their freedom is being taken away. It is easy to see it and feel it when it happens by force such as the Sovietization of Central Europe after Yalta. It is a lot tougher to feel it when you are a lobster in a pot and the water starts off warm and continues to rise in temperature until you are boiled. Brexit was a boiling point. More Europeans than ever are coming to the realization the EU is the equivalent to the lobster pot. 60 plus years of rising water temperatures boiling away European sovereignty has opened a lot of eyes. I will skip over Central Europe because I'm getting a few indications. So I'm, uh, the breakdown of freedom that has been the derivative effect from the breakdown of sovereignty has led to many of the same mental calisthenics Burke warned of in his French Revolution analysis. To achieve the ultimate egalite and fraternite, the liberté must be hindered and subdued and even suborned. In this, the right of the individual is made subservient to the state or superstate, as the case may be, when the state is not already complicit in European establishment value systems. When one cannot express the honest truth for fear of legal retri retribution, whether it be hate speech laws or free press muzzles, such as what goes with failed migrant and refugee assimilation and over-the-top third world ghettoization, the trust in federation plummets. We all remember Cologne's New Year festivities a few years ago and then the coordinated intervention to silence the press who are not already willingly aligned with the message the establishment wanted propagated. This has happened in many European nations and is being called, in true Orwellian sense, a defense of European values. I am old enough to remember when European values were not purely culturally relativistic, but rather openness to inquiry and debate and discourse. Okay, you got me. I'm not really old enough to remember that, but I did read about it in books that have not yet ban been banned. European values for centuries were also oriented around science and discovery and rational, reasonable thought. There why Europe flourished as a competitive group of nation states. It was not mentally obtuse double standards that led to societal success. When a patriotic march on Poland's annual mid-November Independence Day holding the Polish flag is tantamount in the European political establishment's salons to fascist nationalists are marching, this is an affront to human rights. But meanwhile, nary a word is uttered when French President Macron turns the hoses on the unarmed yellow vest protesters, these ignored working class masses taking the to the streets to express their economic dissatisfaction with the government ignoring their well-being as citizens. And when an elderly pensioner is killed or tear gas is used, there's no highfalutin rhetoric out of Brussels whereby by rule of laws under attack, or human rights are being violated. A double standard this brazen opens many eyes. All of these are effects. The cause has been the disintegration of the Westphalian sovereign order in favor of supranational governance. But like with alcoholism and the 12-step program, admitting you have a problem is the first step. Where does that leave us? I'm happy to say I do not think in such a bad place. 
The integration pendulum has swung too far, and now there is a rise in the populist, nationalist, anti-globalist, conservative right-wing, Westphalian patriotic movement cohort across Europe. I will again skip over Central Europe. <laughs> Sorry, Dom. Uh, and I want to close with three quotes from a recent world leader speech that should give all of us looking for a world with competitive sovereignties, putting their best feet forward, bringing forth their comparative advantages in honest, mutually beneficial collaboration, bilaterally or multilaterally, of their own volition, with no coercion. This is giving us hope. This speech was delivered by the most powerful pro-sovereignty leader in the world in a building that is the ultimate symbol of global supranational governance. He is a leading voice for patriotic nationalism, classical liberal values, conservative ones that exalt freedom and liberty. He's a populist. He trusts the will of the people far more than that of the unaccountable, self-interested, oft-cloistered elites who disdain the masses. He is a competitor, a vanquisher of the globalist, open border sowers of chaos, and the deconstructionists of the great institutions and values of Western civilization. I speak, of course, of anyone? Thank you very much. Of Donald Trump, the American president, And these, and these are from his speech at the United Nations General Assembly a few weeks ago. Not surprisingly, this gem of a speech was smothered and completely memory holed in best Pravda practices by the mainstream press. Here are just three snippets, just three. Super fast. Super fast. Our, our t quote, our time is one of great contests, high stakes and clear choices. The essential divide that runs all around the world and throughout history is once again thrown into stark relief. It is the divide between those whose thirst for control deludes them into thinking that they are destined to rule over others and those people and nations who want only to rule themselves. I have the immense privilege of addressing you today as the elected leader of a nation that prizes liberty, independence, and self-government above all." End quote. quote the free world must embrace its national foundations. It must not attempt to erase them or replace them. Looking around and all over this large, magnificent planet, the truth is plain to see. If you want freedom, take pride in your country. If you want democracy, hold on to your sovereignty. And if you want peace, love your nation. Wise leaders always put the good of their own people and their own country first. The future does not belong to globalists. The future belongs to patriots. The future belongs to sovereign and independent nations who protect their citizens, respect their neighbors, and honor the differences that make each country special and unique. End quote. Quote, patriots see a nation and its distance, destiny in ways no one else can. Liberty is only preserved. Sovereignty is only secured. Democracy is only sustained. Greatness is only realized by the will and devotion of patriots. End quote. If ever there was a moment to be optimistic about a resurgent Westphalian order. The most powerful leader on the planet delivering these words on the floor of that United Nations to every nation state leader of the world in one room, it just makes one's heart sing. I think we're gonna be just fine, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.